All right, well, thank you for coming. If I can have everybody's attention, um, thank you very much for, for coming. I'm Ethan Rarick. I'm the director of the Robert T. Matsui Center for Politics and Public Service, which is part of the Institute of Governmental Studies um, here on campus. The Matsui Center was started two years ago to honor Bob Matsui, who is a Cal alum who went on to serve in Congress for 26 years representing the Sacramento area. Um, after his death in 2005, his widow and successor, Doris Matsui, donated his papers to the university and supported the creation of a, of a legacy to, to Bob Matsui uh, by creating the, the Matsui Center here at Cal. Um, we do sort of two things that are oriented towards getting undergraduates involved in politics. We have internship programs, um, both uh, an, a summer internship program in Sacramento, a local summer internship program uh, in local government, uh, and uh, we provide scholarships for people to do the UCDC program in Washington, D.C. So for those of you who are here who are interested in getting practical experience in politics, if you go to our website, which is politics.berkeley.edu, you can look up and get information about our internship programs locally, Sacramento, Washington. Um, the second thing we do is to try to bring distinguished people to campus uh, to expose undergraduates to uh, discussion and ideas about politics, and that's what we're here to do today. Um, through this uh, 2010 uh, version of the Matsui Forum. Um, we're co-sponsoring this with the Undergraduate Political Science Association, so my thanks to them. I think they're still out there giving out flyers. But anyway, thank you to the Undergraduate Political Science Association. And we are holding it, as most of you know, because most of you are in the class, in conjunction with Ted Lempert's class on California politics, PS 171. So um, welcome to those of you from the community, and uh, welcome to the students from PS 171. Um, I'm just going to very briefly uh, introduce Ted. Most of you know him from the course, and then he's going to introduce the panel, and we're going to talk about what the next governor should do. Um, for those of you not in the class, Ted Lempert uh, was one of the most distinguished members of the California Assembly. He actually served two stints in the uh, California Assembly. More recently, has become president of Children Now, an organization that advocates, a nonprofit organization that advocates for children's issues, and for several years now, six years maybe? has taught uh, California politics uh, here at Berkeley. So he's going to moderate this program. Um, we'll have time afterwards for questions, so be thinking of questions. Um, Ted Lampert. Thank you, uh, Ethan, and thanks to the Matsui Center and Institute of Governmental Studies for putting on this great forum and for all the uh, super work you do um, on engaging students and on really uh, tackling the problems facing California. Um, I'm just going to make a couple brief o opening remarks and really along the theme uh, for those, all of us who follow California politics, the next uh, hour and a half is going to be a nice break from the gubernatorial campaign we're engaged with because rather than talk about the past, we're actually going to be looking at the future. And the reference to the past is we've all uh, been bombarded with all the commercials, um, you know, whether it's a, a few years ago and Goldman Sachs and the financial meltdown or last 10 years, you know, what did someone do or not do at eBay or the city of Oakland? We've been going back to Monica Lewinsky, going back to the 1992 gubernatorial debate and CNN fact checking, uh, going back to uh, the 1970s and Linda Ronstadt and uh, who said what about Prop 13. And if you think about it, you've been watching the commercials, we even go all the way back to 1883 when in the hills of Italy, uh, the uh, story Pinocchio was written. So we've been uh, really gotten a lot of the past in this campaign, we're, and we're not going to be talking about today. What we're talking about today, and the focus with this distinguished group of panelists, is starting on November 3rd, the day after the election, whether it's Meg Whitman or Jerry Brown as the new governor, my own personal opinion is the first reaction of both of either of them will be, oh my goodness, what have I done? Jerry Brown saying, I've done this before, and this is a lot more complicated than it seemed in 1974. Um, and Meg Whitman saying, I spent over $100 million for this job. I, personally, I might have bought the Giants or even the 49ers. But anyway, uh, their second question is going to be, in, in all seriousness, how do I be the leader of a state that's in great turmoil, has great needs, and all of us care passionately about making sure um, that good decisions get made for, for the sake of of all the people who live here and, and our future. Um, and there are some serious questions, a lot of which are not being addressed during the campaign, that this panel is going to help address in terms of what should the new governor be focusing on, what should they do. And I'm thrilled with this panel, um, why they represent different viewpoints, different 
backgrounds, uh, different ideologies, one thing knowing uh, all four, uh, some personally, some by reputation, is they all care deeply and passionately about this state and all share a real desire to try to make sure uh, that the best things are done for this state so we can have a, a prosperous a future and, and a place we all want to live. Um, and so I think you're in for a treat to hear from the four of them. Um, how this is going to work is I'm going to each uh, introduce each of them one by one. You have their backgrounds in your program. We've asked them to make about five to seven minutes of opening comments about what should the agenda of the next governor be, what should the next governor do. Uh, then I'll ask them a couple questions and then we will turn it over to the floor and you can uh, raise your hands for questions when we uh, get to that. So with no further ado, um, I, I think it would be easier if I introduce the panel uh, one at a time. Uh, we're going to go in alphabetical order, which is Mark noted, uh, usually when you're in the second half of the alphabet you don't go first, but such is the lineup. So uh, Mark Paul is the uh, co-author of California Crack Up, How Reform Broke the Golden State and How We Can Fix It. Uh, for my students in PS 171, you'll probably be the last class where this book is not required reading. Wasn't quite uh, ready for uh, 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 this class, but uh, Mark is a real uh, a student of California politics, and his book is going to be something that is uh, read by uh, folks throughout the state trying to figure out where we go from here. So it's an honor to have you with us, Mark, and the panel. The floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ted, and uh, thank you, Ethan, uh, for setting this up, and all of you for being here. It's, for me, a particular honor uh, to speak at the Bob Matsui Forum because Bob, Bob Matsui was, was my congressman uh, for uh, 19, 20 years. Um, he was a, you know, a, a great public servant, a, a gentleman, and, and a friend. So I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here speaking uh, in an event named, named for him. Our assigned task uh, here today is was to is to offer a realistic agenda for the next governor. Now, the, the agenda part is easy, and what's hard, I think, is the realism. As I'll explain, what's usually considered realistic in California politics is, is really unequal to the governing crisis we face. Uh, we, in California, need a new realism. So let's start with the agenda. And of course, in California, any agenda has to start with the, with the budget. Um, we have a, a $19 billion budget deficit. We've had budget deficits um, for, for a decade or more in, in, in California. Our current woes come in, in two pieces. One piece is the part of the deficit that was, is driven by the, the Great Recession. It's a, a problem we share in California with, with states across the, across the country as revenue disappeared in the, in the recession. But California has a second part, and in some ways a, a unique part, and that's the structural budget deficit that was opened up in California during the great internet boom of the late 1990s. Back then, California threw itself a hell of a party. We cut taxes, we cut income taxes, corporation taxes, and the vehicle license fee, and we raised spending, uh, temporarily in the case of higher education, transportation, and schools, permanently, for public employee pensions and for prisons. That structural deficit that we created beginning in the late 1990s was deepened earlier in this decade by the resort to, to borrowing in California. We borrowed big, first uh, in beginning in 2004 uh, to cover up the state's inability to make hard choices and deal with the structural deficit. And then later in the decade, we borrowed again to pay for infrastructure that politicians wanted to build, but they didn't want to ask voters to actually pay for. Uh, the share of the state budget that's devoted to debt service, what we pay in interest and principal to repay our debt, has doubled over the last decade to 6% of the state budget on the way to 8% in a couple of years. So the big task of the next governor and the next legislature is to close that structural deficit, both over the long term and the near term, and close it in a way that allows California still to make investments in education and in infrastructure that we need for future economic growth. The common sense way to do that, and the one favored, the way favored by most Californians, is with a combination of spending cuts and tax increases targeted at the least defensible parts claims on, on, the, public, uh, on the public dollar. 
We need to replace the current public employee pension system with its gold-plated benefits with a cash balance pension system of the kind that I and a colleague recently outlined in a recent report for the New America Foundation where I work. We need to overhaul our approach to criminal justice in California. Locking up tens of thousands of aging criminals to be watched over by correctional officers making 40% more than the national average punishes taxpayers as much as it punishes criminals. We also need to raise revenue starting by capturing some of the $6 billion in taxes that are owed under current law but are not paid by people evading taxes. We need to close the commercial property loophole in Prop 13 and use some of the revenue to eliminate business taxes like the tax on sales tax on manufacturing equipment that discourage investment in the state. We need to return to financing our infrastructure with charges paid by the people who use the infrastructure and not with general tax dollars that we need to balance our budgets. You know, measured in real dollars, today we pay only half as much per mile driven uh, in fuel taxes as I did when I came to California in 1966, when I was drawn here by the love songs that the Beach Boys were singing to their little Deuce Coops and their, their Thunderbirds. Today in California, everybody is driving a welfare cattle. The other pressing issue on the state agenda is education. Despite three decades of school reform, California's student achievement still falls well short of what we need for a strong economic future. The state is on track today to have fewer college-educated workers in 2025 than it does today. And that is no way to prosper in, a, in the 21st century, which is, a, is a, the, going to be the human capital century. So we need to do a lot of things on the education side to improve the quality of our teacher workforce, direct more resources, and better the best teachers to the schools with the poorest and least advantaged students, and to build stronger connections in our higher education system between high school and community college and four-year colleges like the UCs and CSU, so that students can actually get the classes they need to move quickly and through the system and we waste a lot of money t today on remediation, on people spending time in, in universities not being able to get the classes they need to get out. We need to change that. Now, all of this, I think, is just common sense. But under California's broken system of government, which is actually three systems at war with each other, it's unrealistic to think that much of it can be enacted. Our election system, magnifies the power of special interests that oppose this agenda, and it shelters lawmakers from accountability for their failure to act. Our second governing system, the system of supermajority votes and budget whips and chains built into our Constitution, gives minorities in the legislature the power to block many of these changes. And our third governing system, the initiative, the most inflexible initiative process in the world, creates new unfunded budget demands and keeps lawmakers from moving money to the places where, uh, that are our highest priorities um, without going back and asking for the voters' permission. And as we saw in the May special election last year, getting that permission can be awfully hard. The reality is, is that California doesn't work because it can't work under the radical and improvised system that we've cobbled together for ourselves over the last 160 years. And the most important job for the next governor is to understand that reality, to explain it to the state, and to lead to us to the kind of California fix that Joe Matthews and I outline in our book, California Crack Up. Exactly 100 years ago, California elected an unlikely governor. Hiram Johnson was the son of a prominent politician who nonetheless campaigned by proclaiming that he was no politician himself. In California, some things never change. <laughs> in the face of a, polit a political deadlock seemingly as intractable as the one we face today, he led the state to remake its government in ways that, even a few years before, had seemed unrealistic and unimaginable. That's how history happens. What seems unrealistic one moment seems necessary and inevitable the next. For the sake of all of us, and especially for you students here today, Let's hope that history happens to California again 
and happen soon. Thank you very much, Mark, for your uh, opening remarks. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Deborah Saunders, who uh, many, if not all of you know, is a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, I actually read uh, Deborah's column before I have my coffee in the, in the morning, which is a real compliment because most things I just can't uh, focus on reading, but her writing is, is clear and, and engaging enough that I'm able uh, to do so. And you can see the rest of her background here, a lot of uh, experience in journalism and in politics. And so, Deborah, your opening comments. Thanks, Ted. So when I got the email from Ethan inviting me to talk about what I do as governor, I thought, oh, this will be really easy. I don't even have to think about it. <laughs> this is a joke. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, <laughs> this is Meg Whitman's campaign book, uh, her whole plan. It's, what, 42 pages? 42 pages about all the things that she would do for California. And it's a very glossy focus group plan that doesn't really say a whole lot, isn't particularly doable, but is likely to please California voters who have very unrealistic expectations. Or I could look at the Jerry Brown plan. Uh, he came to the Chronicle uh, a couple weeks ago, and he brought this big notebook that he said had his ideas in it, but he wasn't going to tell us what was in the notebook. So <clears throat> I think people sort of get the government they deserve. And we have, I think Mark's completely right, a state where People just have a completely unrealistic expectations. Republicans, and I am a Republican, proud, um, keep, keep promising that they will not raise taxes. Democrats uh, keep pushing for more spending. We've been giving this to the voters for years, and they have this unrealistic expectation that they can keep getting more for nothing. It has been very bad for our state. I decided I'd approach this with, what would I do if I were governor? Of course, I demand a recall, right? <laughs> um, I, I don't know, maybe I'd make Meg Whitman my chief of staff. Uh, but so I, I started thinking about, and I think that the first thing that you have to do is, is really come and balance the state budget. We've had this roller coaster. I think it, it is bad for the state. Uh, we don't need this kind of drama. And it's time to end the drama and put together something that that is sustainable, that isn't, we're going to change everything every two years. Um, California voters voted against Proposition 1A, which had a broad tax hike last year, by, by a margin of about two to one. Now, I actually voted for that measure. I voted for it because it was broad-based. It wasn't another one of those horrible, let's, let's tax, tax that rich person. Let's put the money in one place. It was, it was something that... Made, I didn't like the idea of a tax hike. I personally would rather see smaller government, but people have to pay for it. We, you know, we, we can't keep putting it off. Uh, but the voters said no to that, and I think that makes it pretty clear that whoever the next governor is is really going to have to come in and just cut spending. It's not as easy as I would think it would be to look for places because everybody – I mean – Ask somebody, what do you get rid of? Well, you've got those 88 boards and commissions. We don't need them. Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger couldn't even get rid of them. It's time that we had a governor who would get rid of the stuff that everybody can agree on to start, take away those arguments, and then there's just going to be a lot of shuffling. I mean, the California Performance Review, excuse me, the California Performance Review uh, talked about different, I mean, basically, you've got to downsize the state like HP and Compact. There's got, people have been watching the size of the state grow, state government grow, and there just there haven't been any checks on that the way there have been for the rest of us chickens. And I can assure you in the newspaper business, we know what it's like to see things get paired. Um, pensions. The pension system has to change. Now, I don't it's there are a lot of liberals who are now coming to the conclusion that they've got to do something to pare down pensions for state employees and local government employees because it means that there's less money for services. That if you're, if you're going to be paying people to not work, there's less money to pay those who do and less money to pay for the services you want. But I think there's also an issue 
where it's not even good for the young state workers. Is there, is there, is there, they're basically being in, 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 in local governments where they're asked to be doing more and, you know, harder work, they're, uh, they're layoffs, uh, and they have to carry things. So I don't want to sound as if I'm being anti-labor, because I think that this is something, Yvonne, because, <laughs> because, I th because I think that this is something that is in everybody's interest. And I think that this is something that a lot of people in labor think and, and increasingly do because it, things are just so ugly. Um, lifetime medical benefits for people who can retire at age 50, we just can't afford that anymore. It just, it's just not something that, that's doable. Um, and, let me see. So, you're going to say to me, what about tax hikes? Well, you know what? I, I don't like it, but they'd have to be on the table too. But as long as they're broad-based and you're not, it, it, you know, the pro you're, you're a bunch of kids. What's the problem with taxing rich people more? It That's doesn't it. work. Oh. They don't like it, they leave. <laughs> but on top of that, one of the biggest problems that we've had in California is we've got this unstable revenue stream. So when, when things are high, the money just comes rushing in. But if you have a, 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 a bump in the economy, all that extra money stops coming in, and it's painful. You need to have something that's steadier. Now, for the kind of economic woes we're in, I don't think anything would have been steady enough. But you, we have to stop... Uh, basically encouraging this dysfunction. Uh, Peter Schrag, <laughs> uh, Prop 13. Yeah, I think it has to be on the table, but I'd look at basically make, you know, you've got that 2% increase. I'd make it where you could increase uh, property taxes more every year. Tie it to inflation or something. Make it be broad-based. I mean, it hasn't been fair for people to be living next door to each other and one family is paying 3000 a year in property taxes and the person next door pays 500 A law that was designed to keep people from being priced out of their homes I think has just sort of gone a little too far. Um, uh, again, income tax or sales tax, these are horrible. We're one of the, I, I, I'm for as few increases as possible because we're a highly taxed state and we're driving people out of it and we have to, but we have to have um, basically stable taxes. We can't keep moving around on it. And by the way, there are other places where we can look for revenue. Uh, marijuana won't bring in a lot of revenue, but it will bring in some. And, and this is, I'm going to anger everybody here one way or another, offshore oil drilling, more state leases. There are things that we can do like that. Um, illegal immigration is something that the next governor has to look at. If you have over 12% unemployment, you can't afford to have a lot of illegal immigrants in your state. It, they're, they're, taking, they're, they're either working under the table and not contributing, or they're taking away jobs that uh, legal Californians could be working at. Oh, environmental laws. Basically, any environmental law that is, that is built as something that will be a model for the rest of the nation, just get rid of it. Just dump it. If, if it's a model for the nation, that means we didn't need it before, right? Um, and this way, and, and this way, you're basically going to attract. I mean, this is a way to let businesses know that you're not going to. Keep, because let's face it, a lot of the a lot of the uh, regulations they've come up with lately are going to drive up energy costs and other costs through the roof. And it's time that we dealt. It, we can't afford that right now. It's just not time to be experimenting. Uh, and then. Because I'm, I'm actually really like a politic person. Um, I try to get along with people. That's how I lasted the Chronicle for 18 years. Um, and I, don't, I think there are some really good lawmakers in Sacramento. If I were the governor, I'd try to find some of the good lawmakers, the real problem solvers, and, and, and basically give them portfolios like education, transportation, um, and have them try to work on not just cutting costs, but also delivering more for taxpayers for their money. Really try to make these things work better. And I know that one of the questions on the list was term limits. This is, we, we've had these phony, let's change the term limits and tweak them around stuff. People, voters are too smart for that stuff. If I were governor, I would 
take these lawmakers, work with them, tr and then I would, t I, would, I would try to make a contract with the voter, and this is what I'd say. Uh, we're going to really clean things up in Sacramento. In return, we'd like you to get rid of term limits. Just get, we're going to do our jobs, and why don't you treat us like adults afterward? So that's what I'd do if I were governor. <laughs> then it's 3 o'clock, so it was 3 o'clock when I left, so I put the rest of the day off. <laughs> <laughs> More questions coming. So thank you very much, Deborah. Appreciate it. Um, on Labor Day a few weeks ago, the, you had all the stories written about the decline of the uh, labor movement in, in the country. An exception to that is certainly SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, uh, which is known for both of its, its aggressiveness and its growth and its very strong leadership. Um, we have one of uh, its strongest leaders here today, Yvonne Walker, is president of SEIU uh, 1000, the nation's largest state employees union. Uh, Yvonne, thank you for joining us. Look forward to your comments. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I got to say, um, when I was first asked to be on the panel, I couldn't figure out why I was asked. Now I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my views are slightly left. Um, <laughs> to the two previous speakers, just got to say. Um, you know, if I were governor, imagine I'm governor tomorrow, I'd probably call me a lot more because uh, I got a lot of ideas, a lot of good ideas, things to do. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, I, having been elected to my position, you know, I run a union of 90, represent 95,000 workers, right? And it's really easy to say, if I were king, this is what I would do. And then wake up one day and you're king and realize you really can't get all of it done. You have to focus in on what's important, what's key, you know, and then try to figure out how to change everybody else's mind who believes they should have been king anyway, right? And that's the biggest challenge. Probably one of the first things I would do is... I, I do a review. I do a review of government. I do a review of all of the departments. I do think that there are some things in government that um, they're redundant. You know, um, we should look at what departments really should be combined and not combined, and how can we make government work better? You know, um, and and that doesn't necessarily happen. That doesn't necessarily happen. I'd start a conversation with the workers because I can tell you for everybody that's out there working a job, they can tell you that one little tweak or that the, those things that can be done that would make it work better. But I'd also start a conversation with the taxpayers because the one thing that has been said that is absolutely right, you get what you pay for. And you cannot continue either by initiative or by law to continue to heat things on without trying to figure out how do you pay it and what's important. As, I read, as I've been reading the paper, because we're in the election cycle and everybody's got an opinion, you know, I think it's a shame that the state parks, right, which I think were the jewel of California, right, the jewel of the nation, that they're going into decline because you know what? Everybody decided they wanted parks, but nobody decided they wanted to keep them up. You know, you have to start the conversation. What is it we really want? What is it that, that we really need to have? I think term limits are the worst thing that ever happened to California. Only because it took away our responsibility as voters. If you have a legislator that's there in his job and they're not doing the job, then what do you do? You vote them out. But we, we took that away from ourselves by initiative. We got lazy and said, well, if they're not doing what we want them to do, ah, they'll only be there for a short term and then they'll be gone. But ultimately that's hurt us all because you don't have a legislator now who can really dig in deep on the issues, who really know what the issues are, pro and con. And so most is being done by who's ever yelling the loudest, what your tax base is. It's not necessarily done by what's good for California. I don't necessarily think that corporations in and of themselves are bad, but we shouldn't fool ourselves. Government is not corporate America. We are not run, we are not a for-profit business, and we should not be run as a for, 
for-profit business. And I just have to say that I just want to know where the Cadillac pension is because I don't have one. And nobody I represent has a Cadillac pension. You know, the majority of the workers that I represent, they're not retiring at 50 because they can't afford to. Most of them will retire with, at, at, on average, like $1,200 a month. That is not a Cadillac pension for years of service. I really think the conversation has to be not about how do we take pension benefits away from somebody, but how do we ensure retirement security for everyone? I think it's absolutely wrong to live in a country as great as the United States, and we had to have a debate over health care, and we're going to have to have a debate over retirement security. There is something absolutely wrong with that. I believe health care should be a right, not just health care reform or health care insurance. Health care should be a right. Retirement security should be a right. When we talk about education, people talk about higher education, but you instill the love of learning at the lower grades, not at your age. You guys are all achievers. You are going to be achievers. You're going to get somewhere because you're here. But how do you install that love of learning into your classmate that you started school with in kindergarten and first grade that are not here with you? That's really what we need to figure out because really you guys are my future. You're my kid's future, my grandkid's future. And I don't think it's something that we can start worrying about later. It's something we really have to start worrying about now. When we look at the prisons, right, at some point along the line, California made the decision that they were going to build more prisons than they ever built schools or universities. Well, that was wrong, and we were putting people in prison just to have them in prison. And we totally forgot that about rehabilitation. i got to tell you, I want a prisoner. I mean, I think people should go to jail. If you've done something wrong, you should go to prison. You should serve your time. But I at least want to have believe that there's the opportunity that they're going to be they're going to come out a little bit better, not better criminally, right? But they're going to come out with skills that'll actually help them add to the tax base and pay taxes and be part of society. And we have totally, totally moved away from rehabilitation in our prison system. Now, when you look at um, corrections in other states, and studies have been done. For every dollar that you spend on rehabilitation in prison, you save $2 on the other end. Most other states, New York in particular, have caught on to that and have really started directing their funds into rehabilitation. We have not. We're still in locking up and keeping them locked up regardless. You know, um, that seems to be our thing, lock them up and throw away the key. And I guess finally I would say, you know, everything we do has to be on balance, Right? It can't be all, all taxes, as much as I hate to say that. It can't be all taxes. <laughs> there has to be a balance. You have to be responsible about the things that you do. I do it like I do my own budget at home, right? You know, There's always something that you want, but just because you want it doesn't mean that you get it at that moment. You figure out how you're going to pay for it and can you sustain paying for it. That's why you know, I drove a car for... Ten years, you know, until it actually died because I thought, well, you know, I don't want a car payment. If I get a new part car payment, what does this do to the budget? My insurance goes up. Do I really want to pay that now? So I planned it out, and I think that you do have to have some kind of planning. It can't be by extremes, and, and I don't think anymore that we can afford to have extremists from any parties, either extreme, extreme Democrats or certainly um, extreme Republicans. We should... We deserve better. We deserve better than our legislators, than just legislators that can only say no. There, there's something really wrong with that. And I think I covered all of my points. And also, the next governor's focus really has to be jobs. I mean, we should have been training for the jobs of the future 10 years ago instead of believing that we could ride this incredible bubble of the internet and every other thing that came along. And I don't think that we did that. And I don't, if we did it, we didn't do it well. And that's it. Thank you very much, Ron.
Our next speaker, uh, Bill Whalen, is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, which is located at that other university down the road. Um, Bill is a, uh, sorry, uh, is a uh, well-respected uh, analyst of California uh, government um, in, in addition to his role at Hoover. Um, and he's uh, worked for uh, two former, uh, well, one current governor, Governor Schwarzenegger, former Governor uh, Wilson, and also uh, two other very well-respected um, uh, former politicians, uh, Bill Jones and, and Tom Campbell. So, Bill, welcome. Thank you. When I told my colleagues I was coming over here today, they had one word for me. Good luck getting back. <laughs> um, Ted wants us to talk about what happens beginning November the 3rd, but the reality is we should be looking sooner than that. We should be looking to about 11 o'clock on the night of November the 2nd. If you figure this is going to be a close governor's race, and historically governor's races are either blowouts or they're very thin, this one looks like it's going to be thin. About 11 o'clock, three hours after the polls close, we'll probably know who won. And at that point, the next governor, and for the sake of conversation, let's call the next governor 39, since we can't fix the governor's last name, we can't even use a pronoun in this case. Let's just go with 39. 39 is going to come down from the hotel suite where they've watched the results. 39 gets to give a victory speech. There is some poor SOB on each of these campaigns who has to, in the last 48 hours of the campaign, write the victory speech and the concession speech. And I can, tell you, I can tell you, having worked on a lot of Republican campaigns in California, you get very good, very fast at running concession speeches, <laughs> which never get given because the candidate, last thing you want to do is be a noble loser. So 39 gets to step in front of the podium. Everyone's delirious. It's morning in America again. And 39 has to do something very simple, which is lacking in this election right now. 39 has to claim a mandate. 39 has to basically explain why it is they ran for governor. When you write a speech, it's very tempting to press a macro on your computer in a situation like this. And you press F5, and up pops a phrase. The people have spoken tonight, and here's what they've said. So ask yourself as you watch, uh, as you watch these two candidates, whoever wins on election night, what will they say when they get the obligatory line, the people have spoken? Because that's what's missing in this election right now. By my count, this is the fourth of what I'd call angry governor's race we've had in California in the last 32 years. But in these three previous races, each one is very clearly defined as to what the voters were angry about. 1978, Prop 13 in property taxes. 1994, three strikes in criminal justice reform and Proposition 187, illegal immigration. 2003 in the recall, the electricity crisis, the VLF, the car tax, and the governor signing a, a driver's license bill for illegal immigrants. Very, very pointed anger by voters in those three elections. But in a state right now in which 8 out of 10 voters think the state is on the wrong, on the wrong path and they're in a bad mood, what exactly are they angry about and what exactly do they want done? 39's first test, beginning at 11 o'clock on November the 2nd, is to find what it is exactly voters are upset about and how they plan to fix the problem. That leads us into challenge number two, which does not begin on November the 3rd but begins a little later, and that is how to deal in life after Arnold. For the past seven years, we've had a California political press corps on steroids. <laughs> and the steroids work as such. Arnold came to town in November of 2003, and the media circus followed. Television bureaus from around California that had pulled out of California in the late 80s and the early 1990s, they came back in. And why do they come back in? Because Arnold, whether you like him or not, is good copy. And a very funny thing happened in California politics. The governor I worked for, Every time we had a meeting about communications with him, it began with one basic question. How many cameras can we get to the event? With all apologies to my friend in print, it's about getting on television in California. I will not forget the day when we sent him down to Los Angeles, had a very careful event set up, and something strange happened in L.A. and the time that it took him to get down there. Uh, either there was a slow-speed car chase on the, on the 405, Michael Jackson's chimpanzee got loose, something <laughs> happened that took all the cameras away from Pete Wilson, and he went to the event, and one camera showed up, and it was a camera from a Taiwanese television bureau. <laughs> so we all went back to our offices, and we found this happened, and we all quickly updated our resumes. And the <laughs> governor's going to come back and look for vengeance, but he didn't. But this is the problem, the challenge facing 39. Unlike Arnold, who can go out in the hallway and blow his nose and get four cameras to show up, <laughs> 39 will not have this luxury. 39 is going to have to find new and inventive ways to get attention. And 39 is going to have to resist the temptation to get noticed in one of two ways, which is the budget stalemate, the showdown that all governors love because guess what? It draws national attention. I'm standing up for my principles. I'm not going to give in to the other side, blah, blah, blah. Or, even worse for our system, the tendency to go to the initiative process. 
In other words, if I can't work with the legislature and get something done, I'll just go park 30 or 40 million dollars and let the public decide for us, which I think overall has had a very, very debilitory, a debilitating effect on our state. So problem number one is defining your mandate, if there is such a thing as your mandate. Problem number two, getting media noticed. So how do we get around this? I think there are three people that 39 should be looking at at this point. Number one, Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York City. And you probably saw in the papers the past week that Meg Whitman uh, has passed the Michael Bloomberg record of $109 million in a campaign. Uh, Bloomberg, by the way, spent $109 million to get all of 550,000 votes. So it's about 186 bucks a vote. So Meg will need about 4 million votes to win this election. She'd have to spend about $750 million to keep it on the Mike Bloomberg scale of things. But Bloomberg did a very smart thing when he was first elected mayor way back when. He had spent a vast fortune to get elected, and he sat on his hotel bed wherever he was, and he realized, oh my God, I'm in charge of this government. What do I do? So he went out and he tasked himself with one mission, which is to hire very smart, competent people to run his city government for him because he realized he knew nothing about running government. And that was the key to his success in his first two terms as mayor. And people will tell you that's why he's in trouble right now and his mayor has gotten caught up in the mosque controversy and other issues. That's because his A team is long gone and he's on to his B team and his C team. So number one, talk to Mike Bloomberg and get good management around you. Number two, 39 should talk to Chris Christie. Whether you like Chris Christie or dislike Chris Christie, the newly, the newly elected uh, governor of New Jersey, you have to give him credit for this. On paper, this is about as likely a success story as you're going to get. The biography is not terribly compelling. The man's overweight. And the last time he elected a fat man to office in California was, I think, Hiram Johnson back around the turn of the last century. Heavy people traditionally do not do well in politics. Chris Christie speaks with a lisp. These should all be vast strikes against him, but he's doing well in his job. And why is he doing well in his job? He is organized down to the, down to the, down to the dot. Chris Christie, the day after he, was, uh, after he won on November the 3rd of last year, he announced a bipartisan task force, a bipartisan task force with the mission of exploring government. Each one got a section of the government and was asked to report to him two days after he was sworn in how to improve government, and indeed they did. If you go onto Christie's website, it looks like a teacher's syllabus. It's just every day is something that he's done on a successful front. And I would counter in this age when people, I think, are looking for genuine politicians and they're willing to set aside a little flash for just competency and success. Christie is a good model to look for. And then the third governor, the third person I'd look at, 39, is my old boss, Pete Wilson, in this regard. Wilson uh, stepped into just a bad, if not a worse, situation when he took office in 1991. The uh, budget he was looking at, the deficit, was about $14 billion in a $43 billion budget. That's about a one and three hole. Uh, the current uh, hole is about 19.1 for 83 and a half, so it's about one and four and a half dollars. Uh, Wilson also is facing a cratering economy. The Cold War had ended, the aerospace industry had collapsed. So Wilson got to work, and Wilson's primarily focus was to do one thing, that was grow the economy. And <laughs> piggyback on what she just said about this, that is really this next governor's 39's task. That's how to grow the economy. Why? Jobs. And why jobs? You guys cannot stay in graduate school forever, much as you'd like. You want to get a job sooner or later, so good jobs should be available. Second, jobs equals revenue. Revenue is equals more money into Sacramento, Sacramento, at which point we can actually make spending choices rather than spending cuts. So those are the choices ahead for, uh, for uh, 39, and, and I'm the only person on this panel who sat inside a governor's office. By the way, that's not necessarily a bragging point. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you very much, Bill, and, and thanks to the four panelists for uh, get, getting this started. Excellent opening remarks, and I think you see, uh, a few common points and, and a lot of different uh, uh, viewpoints. So please get your questions ready. I'm just going to start this off by asking uh, two questions. One, one area where you, uh, you see a, a number of Democrats and Republicans sort of gelling is this idea of local control, trying to shift more responsibility back locally, although there's you know, lots of pros and cons to that. Just a few uh, comments from a any of all of you of what you would recommend uh, to the governor in terms of the concept of trying to sh shift more services, responsibility, revenue raising authority to the locals. Anybody? Well, I can start. The, uh, the, the, that is, it is essential, you know, the, I think that California try to move more power out of Sacramento back to local governments. If for no other reason than, you know, this is a state of 38 million people. We, we, we have, you know, our different, the different regions of the state. Um, for instance, the north state, uh, north of Sacramento, is as different from Los Angeles as Wyoming is for, from New York City. 
Um, California really is a nation without states, and a lot of the a lot of the choices that we need to make, uh, and that people want to make, differ from community to community. There ought to be ought to be more. Um, um, discretion at the local level for people to set their, their own, own course. The problem is, is that runs smack dab into to the third rail of California politics, which is Prop 13. Proposition 13, most people don't understand this, this, but the biggest effect that Prop 13 had was not on property taxes, but was on the distribution of power and the nature of government in California. It, it specified that once we cut the taxes, that all the remaining property taxes would be divvied up among local governments, some special districts, school districts, cities, counties. Those decisions would be made in Sacramento by the legislature. And of course, at the same time, Proposition 13 also said that now it takes a two-thirds vote to raise any taxes. So at the same time as Prop 13 put more decision-making made Sacramento the place where all the decisions get made, it made it harder for Sacramento to make decisions. And, and so we have seen the centralization of power because of Prop 13, and the only way to have real decentralized decision making in California is to allow local governments to make their own decisions about how much revenue they raise and how much they want to spend. Um, for government to work well, the decisions about about raising revenue and spending the money need to be located in the same place. So it's one of the chapters in our book. We talk about this. So, so yes, it's a good idea, but remember, you, this runs smack dab into Prop 13. It, you can't talk about decentralizing power in California unless you're willing to confront that. Are there comments on that? Oh, fine. Well, I think it's. Uh you know, it's kind of a mixed bag for me. I think that it is, it might very well be the right thing to move services back to the county, but the one thing that you have to figure out is to make sure that they have the revenue stream um, to be able to support those services. And then I also think that you have to, there has to be minimum things that uh, people can expect, because what I would hate to see is you have one county that offers, you know, um, in-home support services so people don't have to go into nursing homes. And another county that says, no, we're not going to offer it. Or, or one county that um, their schools might be better, you know, and only because you happen to live in this county because you have a better tax break, which exists now, but it, I think it would widen that gap. So we have to make sure that there's minimum standards and the revenue stream goes with it. Yeah, I would... Uh I'm usually a little leery about local government. Uh, I look at the good folks who run the city of Bell, California, and wonder if that's a, that's a good example of local government. Uh, the one area which would interest me, though, is education. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a cliche to say by now, I'm going to say it so long, but the idea of block granting uh, down to the local level and letting them run education. Uh, we've created a true mess in Sacramento with education over the past 20 years. We have a, we have a superintendent of public instruction whose job is to basically go around and do photo ops. Uh, the governor has a Department of Education. We have 120 lawmakers, each of whom thinks they're smarter than teachers and principals. Uh, I'd just like to see the money go straight to the districts and, and let them work at it. Uh, my, my second question will be a, a moderator's prerogative, so a multi-part question you can just touch on briefly before we open it up. I'm always, one thing a governor ha or a president has power to do is set priorities. I'm, st I'm struck in California politics by the lack of focus on what are the priorities. We always talk about taxes, spending without breaking down what we're, we're spending on. And uh, EdSource just came out just in the last week comparing us with other states, which is another comment you might want to respond to, why we don't look that, why we don't focus that much on how other states are spending their money. And we find that California, at least EdSource, according to EdSource, way above the national average on corrections, police and fire, and health, and around middle on K through 12 and public welfare, below average on higher ed and highways, not something I think most legislators know. So the, the question, multi-part question is, can, should California learn something by looking at how other states are spending their money and where we rank, yes or, or no? And then second, why, sh sh how would you advise the governor to talk about these different services? And rather than uh, sp uh, spend and, and cut, should we be spending more some places and cutting others, assuming that you took all the barriers away and you could you had your, the money how would you spend it where should we be spending more where should we be spending less so there should be enough for to, each of you to comment briefly on that and then we'll open it up who wants to go first 
Well, the problem with the question is kind of on a shaky premise because there's precious little in the budget you can actually play with. Uh, Mark probably knows the exact figure. It's what, 80 cents of every dollar is essentially locked up? Yeah, no, it's, that's it, really it, actually, yeah. let me just reframe the question. Okay. I, asked this, <laughs> I asked this to uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's finance person, and I got it during the headlights. I said, assume you could spend it however you want. No barriers. You have the money you've got. It's no, no propositions, no barriers. Where would you spend it? What are the priorities? Where would you spend more? Where would you spend less? If I get to be God for a day and get to decide where to spend it? Uh, let's say I'd spend more on education. I'd spend more on infrastructure. And uh, I'd throw a curveball at you. I'd have to look at waste in government. And I know everybody rolls their eyes when you say waste in government. But believe me, it's got it's to be there in an $88 billion budget. It's got to exist. I, I, think, I think what people really look for is they want teachers, police, and fire. They want roads or transit. And they don't understand. There's this, there's this sort of machine in Sacramento that they just don't understand. They know what they, that when, when you ask them about what they're looking for in government, it, that's frequently not what they're, what they're looking for. So I think that obviously, if, I think if taxpayers could re-decide again, that you would, speak, you would see a lot more emphasis uh, in moving money into, into lo so that there are better local decisions that can be made. It's, it's, the, it's the bureaucracy that people don't go for. I was looking over the California Performance Review and the Ledge Analyst Review of it, and, and, and Bill's right. The, I mean, there are, there are things that can be done. You can take the Franchise Tax Board and the Board of Equalization, and the State Schools Chief is a good example. I'd love to see Sacramento use the same categorical funding, which I'll explain what that is in a second, basically give the money to the school districts and don't require them to spend it a certain way. Right now, it's, by the way, the, the other villain is, besides Prop 13 is the Serrano decision, a legal decision that basically required that all school districts get the same amount of money, but then there could be extra money directed toward uh, students who had special needs. They're poor, they're on the school lunch program. Uh, I mean, there, there's a list to that, and we should just be giving it to that, that money to the districts and letting them decide how they're going to spend it. Um, I don't actually think that we spend too much on, on, on law enforcement and corrections. I think that, I mean, we, I think that we, pay, we pay too much for it, but I, I don't actually think too many people are incarcerated. I just have to disagree with something that's been discussed here. Uh, a lot of people look at prop, at, at three strikes, and they think that, um, that we just lock people up and throw away the key. But it's made the state safer. It's reduced the crime rate. And I'm someone who's been highly critical of a number of uh, drug laws and other laws, both federal and state. But there are some very dangerous people who belong in prison. We shouldn't be paying as much per prisoner as we are. And the Corrections Union has way too sweet a deal. But I think it's worth, I think at a reasonable rate, it would be worth every dime. Honor Mark, any comments before we? I, I, I just think the question probably is, uh, you know, I, I just don't see that that is the way to frame it. Um, um, you know, we need to, to, to be investing more money, I think, in infrastructure. But the, the bigger questions you know, in California are really uh, how do we use that money effectively, both in schools and, and, and in, in uh, uh, infrastructure and, and the like. Um, and it's just given, given you know, the large budget deficit and how so far we are from actually being able to pay for what we have today, which is, is I can go into this more later, you know, very slim compared to other states. Um, that it's just not realistic. I mean, if we're talking about realism, that we're going to spend a whole lot more on some of these other things in, in the near term. That the real, the task ahead of us for the next several years is to use use the money we have effectively to, to, ra to raise some more, to pay for things that actually were, you know, are, exist now that we don't know how to pay for. You know, again, it, it goes back to, for me to, to balance and looking at what's important, and I do agree. <clears throat> actually, I don't agree. Um, I don't know. We <laughs> that was supposed to be my inside voice. Um, we uh, 
Infrastructure is important. Police officer, firefighters are important, right? And, and maybe it was just when I grew up, we had after school programs that your parents didn't have to bankrupt themselves. Most of them were free. You could go, kids were there, they had a better influence. All of that went away. We had a lot of programs that went away, you know. Kids nowadays, they can't participate in after school sports. Um, there are a lot of school districts where you don't have music in the school. I mean, do you want to be a society where we're only police officers and firefighters and we have no music and we have no laughter and we have no fun because you know what? We don't want to pay for it and we've got to pay taxes for it. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. That's not the world I want to live in. Some things you pay for because, you know, you teach people how to appreciate things because sometimes the, the, the music programs, sometimes that was the only place where kids ever really knew music. And music is what opens your imagination, right? Imagine a creative writing program after school, right, that you could go to and get your homework done too and have different aspirations. But I think that sometimes we think in terms of concrete things and we put too much value on the concrete things. I would pay tons more for the IHSS in-home support services, right? Rather than having, you know, our older citizens having to go to nursing homes because they can't stay home, right? Because there's nobody there to take care of them. If you can have somebody that can come in, you know, for a few hours a day and they're able to stay in their home with dignity and respect, that's worth something to me. I'd pay for it. So I just think we really have to have a conversation about how we spend our money. Okay, unlike the state budget in Sacramento, we are right on time. Ethan told me to turn it over to questions from the floor at 510. How do you like that? So uh, good, good job, Leslie. We are going to open up. Mark is going by with the mic. Raise your hand, and I'll point, and Mark will hand you the microphone. So yes, right there in front. Please speak into the mic. And you can direct it to uh, one uh, member or the whole panel panelists. Um, I just urge you, I think there's going to be a number of questions. Try to keep the answers really brief so we can get as many as possible. This is for Ms. Saunders. Um, I find it a bit ironic that you scoffed at Meg's plan, um, saying it wasn't very concrete, but then you yourself just rehashed a bunch of Republican views, especially on immigration. You gave the typical scapegoating of blaming immigrants. So if you were governor the following election, what would you actually do to fix the so-called immigration problem instead of just scapegoating again on immigrants? Well, I would... I would, uh, first of all, distinguish between illegal and legal immigrants and do everything I could to make legal immigrants feel welcome. But I would look for areas where we could cut benefits for people who are not here legally. I would uh, work with law enforcement to go after employers who hire illegal immigrants. We've got a $19 billion shortfall. We can't afford this. We've got 12, oh, our, our unemployment rate is over 12%. We can't afford to uh, encourage people to come here and take jobs that, Calif that, that Californians should have. That's what I do. What, can I, what, what, be what benefits, what benefits do, does California give to uh, people here, here illegally? Um, <laughs> citizen children. I mean, there, there, there are citizen children cases where uh, illegal immigrant parents can get welfare benefits, and there are health care benefits that, that we give to people who are, who are on health care programs, so, uh, you know, it's, they, they cost money. I mean, they're not, they're not free. Higher education, great example, Bill. We have, you know, there are students, if, 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 I don't know why we would pay to give a break in tuition to somebody who can't work here legally. They were born here. Okay, okay. No, they, no, no, they, those, those are students. Guys, anybody, who's born here, anybody who's born here is a citizen. We're not talking about citizens. Citizens get every benefit to which they're entitled. Okay. Let's make sure everyone has a chance to ask questions. I don't, I don't mind the back and forth, but I also want to just have a, you know, make sure we have a lot of time for questions and respectful discourse. So uh, in the back there. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Bill Whalen. Um, so I follow the paper a lot, and to this day, I still have not heard what, let's say Meg Whitman gets elected, what in the world is she going to do in a blue state? Um, as working on Schwarzenegger's, well, working in his office, you, we all saw that Schwarzenegger, you know, said, let's take it to the people with the initiative process. 
But besides initiatives, like, what is she going to be able to do? I, I just have not heard a concrete answer yet as to how a Republican is going to be able to make any changes in such a, you know, partisan gridlock. Well, uh, let's go back to the Pete Wilson example, uh, because, again, he faced roughly two-thirds majorities in legislature, as, as would uh, Whitman if she's elected. Uh, one thing Wilson did, which was very smart, was he scared the legislature straight on the economy. He went to them with a whole series of uh, tax cuts and deregulation measures and so forth. They all said, this is a bunch of crap. The state's not this horrible. He put some lawmakers on a plane with him and flew around the country. And it was a scared straight tour. And he went to businesses around the country that had eschewed California, had chosen not to do business here. And they told the legislature straight up, this is how awful. So this is probably the first thing Whitman can do. She can extend the olive branch to the Democrats in the legislature. They may be rough, but she's a better person for at least offering it. Uh, she's also smart. She'll put some Democrats on her transition committee like Chris Christie did. Uh, the second thing is she actually has leverage uh, in this regard. She has leverage in terms of her wealth. Uh, for as much as she's derided for her wealth, her wealth does give her this advantage. She can, if she so chooses, and I would predict if she's elected, she'll do this within a year or so in office, she will have to go to the ballot, uh, probably to establish alpha status in Sacramento and pick one fight, and the fight will probably be pensions. Uh, and if she focuses on it and spends enough money, she may win. Arnold's mistake. Arnold came in in his first year in office, and the legislature was frightened. They thought, oh, my God, this man won almost 50 percent of the recall vote. He is charming. He's personable. He can go to the ballot and defeat us. We're going to work with him. And sure enough, he got a deal in workers' compensation. Then two things happened. Number one, Arnold went around the state in 2004 and campaigned for Republicans, and they lost to a man, to a woman. Each one lost and the legislators realized Superman isn't necessarily Superman. Then secondly, Arnold in 2005, November 2005, had that tragically bad uh, special election. He put a, put a whole series of ideas, each one interesting in its own right, but none connected whatsoever. And to hear Arnold in his English, God, I gotta go to this, go to do that, and kind of race through it. It didn't work. And he got skunked. And at that point, he retreated, and he left his Republican side and became postpartisan Arnold. So for Whitman, it's number one, she has to at least give the appearance of being bipartisan, reach out. And then secondly, if she's rejected in reaching out, she's going to have to pick a fight, but pick a fight that she can win. Other questions? Uh, can you get the mic in the middle there? We just need to use the mic because it's uh, so that things are recorded. My question is uh, to Saunders. I just want to touch on just real briefly again on the immigration, uh, what you were talking about for the illegal immigrant population and how it's costing our state money in regards to taxes. And I just wanted to point out that um, the immigrants, they do pay taxes. It's called the I-10. It's an individual tax identification number. And basically, they put money into the system, and not, they're not receiving a lot of the benefits out of it. And basically, in regards to health care, it's more in rare cases when it's an emergency crisis. And in regards to higher education, it's through private fund, uh, funding, through scholarships, and et cetera, you know. So basically, if we are going to be dealing with this entire immigration issue, if we are even going to be thinking about deportation, that's going to cost a significant amount of money to deport this entire population that's in California. So if we're looking into this, like Do we're... Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we're looking into this um, for the whole deportation, as you're saying, and you want to get them out of get them out of the state, aren't we going to be losing a lot of money by doing that? Or? Well, the state government doesn't deport people. The federal government deports people. No, no, no. You said you were going to... No. Why, why don't we get, we get okay. the question. So why don't you end in if any other panelists want to talk about... The yeah, I mean, issues the state up. government doesn't deport. The, the federal government deports, but we can make it uncomfortable for people to be here illegally and make it difficult for employers to knowingly hire illegal immigrants. That's what I suggested. I'm not talking about deporting the state, deporting people. It doesn't have the authority. Any other comments from the panel on this? Well, I, I just part? want to point out that in, ter in budget terms, the amount of money that people who are here illegally cost in benefits is budget lent in, in our $88 billion budget. The only, any, only thing that actually amounts to any real big dollars is paying to school the legal children of people who are here uh, illegally. Now, if and, it, and how much I, is that, Mark? I th you think it comes to a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's an investment in children who are American citizens, who are who are going to be here, who are going to be productive. Uh, it, it is under the under Supreme Court decision, we're required to provide that education, um, and we would be stupid not to. 
So, so in, this is, is an issue that in budget terms, let's remember people what we're talking about. We have a $19 billion budget deficit. That is equivalent to closing every prison in the state of California, closing every California State University, and closing every UC campus. That's what we're talking about, the budget gap that we face. And just for clarification, that's a U.S. Supreme Court decision. So U.S. California, yeah, it was, yeah. we, the schooling issue was not yeah. one that would yeah. be addressed by California. Okay, down here. Right there. Hi, this is a general question for the panel. Uh, when it comes to using the money that is available wisely, would you still consider it a gamble in these economic times to be investing in infrastructure? I've seen reports by 60 Minutes that say that the uh, investment in just something as local as the Bay Bridge has tripled just because of the changes in the economic situation of California. And so we, in these times, do you think that is it, is it still a gamble, as I assume, or is it a safe bet to be, be, to be investing at this time? I guess I'm, I'm unclear what the question is. Actually, I mean, it's a great time to be investing in infrastructure because you can build it cheap, more cheaply now because we've got the entire correct construct, private construction industry, at least in the home, home sector and much of the commercial building sector, unemployed. So this is the time when we ought to be, ought to be investing. And, you know, you certainly, I've spent the last couple of weeks running around California. I can tell you that, uh, you know, the, the, the traffic and, and the rest, the congestion at airports, et cetera, you know, we have huge unmet needs in California for infrastructure. Um, but, of course, we can't afford to do it ourselves right now. That's what, that's what the federal government is for. Uh, and, unfortunately, Congress, you know, sized that stimulus package way too small last year. Um, to actual, actually meet all of the, uh, to, the needs, both of the economy, to fill the demand left by the recession and, and to meet the needs for infrastructure here and elsewhere in the country. But, but I think you make a good point, which is we can't, I mean, we, we, the voters just passed that light rail, you know, the high-speed train, I mean. We can't afford it. I mean, we, we're having trouble paying our bills. So as much as everybody likes to talk about the need for us to spend more on in infrastructure, we, first we have to balance the budget before we start looking at other projects, I think. Bonneville idea on infrastructure before we get next question. Uh, when when uh, companies are looking to states like California to move in, they make some very basic calculations. They look at the tax structure, they look at the school system because their employees going to be going to have kids going to schools, and thirdly, they look at infrastructure so it's tied in. Uh, speaking of infrastructure, I did drive up on the I-5 from Los Angeles two weeks ago, and this is one good thing about the bad budget. I didn't see a single CHP trooper on the whole way up. The <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Um, next uh, question over here, so I don't make Mark have to walk all the way over. Okay, Mark, you're walking all the way over. Uh, <laughs> uh, right there on the side, and then we'll go to the middle. Yeah, Mark can get his exercise here. <laughs> My name is Laura Wells, and I'm running as a Green Party candidate for governor this year. And one of the things that I've been looking at how the structure of the decision making in Sacramento is and what do you think of the fact that um, prop, the old Prop 13 brought in a two-thirds uh, requirement in order to raise revenue so that would be any existing tax or any tax like an oil severance tax that all other states have but this state doesn't or say a sales tax on the financial transactions and things like that. So if that takes a two-thirds majority, but it's a simple majority to lower taxes, which was done in all of those years. And now when we need it, we can't get it back. So my question, and I don't know who exactly might want to take it, but, but my question is how would uh, the governor deal with that, that perfect storm? Okay, well, I'm going to take no, a crack fine. at your question. I don't know if it's going to, I'll, I'll rephrase your question a little bit. I don't, uh, I believe that we need to move away from uh, the two-thirds majority uh, to raise taxes. But we also need to move away. If it's a majority vote to lower taxes, it should be a majority vote to raise them. I, I, that's just my basic philosophy. It doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't make sense that you can wipe out revenue very easily 
but you you can't build it back up because we live in a, a time of ebb and flow, right? And so, but how would the governor deal with it? Who knows? Um, if you want to change the two-thirds rule, you have to go to the ballot. And I can give you a chapter or verse of groups that have looked at this, and they pulled it, and they focus grouped it, and it's a loser. The voters don't want it touched. Um, I think it would be interesting to maybe try something a little different in terms of lowering taxes. You could uh, do, say, what they did with the Bush tax cut, and say in California that if you want to ta cut, cut taxes, put a five-year window on it. Uh, I'd also tie that into, by the way, something with the legislature, which I'd have something like a sunset commission, which they have in Texas, which they take every uh, uh, rule and regulation state government, I think every 10 to 12 years, each one dies unless it's automatically renewed. But uh, you cannot go to the ballot without changing this, which begs the question, which you haven't got to yet, but we will soon, a constitutional convention. Yeah, I, 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 the, the people on the left talk all the time about getting rid of the two-thirds rules. Um, but Bill is right. You know, voters are not willing to do that because they don't trust the legislature. So, so what we need to do is we need to get rid of those two-thirds rules, but we need to change our electoral system so we can create a legislature that's actually accountable to the people, that the, le that, that the people of California can change. I mean, we've had to spend an hour and a half here saying, well, what's the next governor going to do? You know, the governor is just, you know, it's one branch of government. The legislature makes the laws, and we're not talking about it. And why aren't we talking about it? Because under our current system, there's not a chance in hell that the legislature will much, look much different uh, in come January than it does today because of the way we've sorted ourselves in California into communities of the like-minded with, with, with uh, Democrats on the coast and a red interior, Republican interior. Most seats in California, even with an independent redistricting commission, are going to remain uncompetitive. Um, there's no way to hold them accountable uh, for, for when they do things wrong. Voters, we need to do the two things in tandem. And third, change the initiative process as well so that we have a system that finally functions together, not these three warring systems that I, that I talked about. Uh, Bill teed it up. Who wants to say why the Constitutional Convention would be a good idea and who wants to say why it would be a bad idea, real quick? Any of you want to say why it would be a good idea? Well, it's either, it's either a panacea or it's a Pandora's box, and I, I vote for Pandora's box, uh, in, in part because I think a group of very good-minded citizens will be overwhelmed uh, by political professionals, uh, present company excluded, uh, who, will, uh, who will just come up with every sort of devious uh, bad idea. For example, Mark and I, Mark and I disagree on the two-thirds requirement for the budget. You need a two-thirds majority to pass a budget. The complaint is you'd have the budget done quicker. Uh, I would equate the art of passing a budget with the art of lovemaking, in which speed is not necessarily uh, the best thing at all times. Lively panel. Okay. Uh, <laughs> without touching that, any other comment on the Constitutional Convention? The kind of changes we need you know, require, un under the California's constitutional rules, either a Constitutional Convention or a Revision Commission uh, set up uh, to put together a, ser a series of changes that work together as a whole. I think either either route is poss possible. You know, that's what I think the next governor really ought to do. I think the smartest thing for the next governor to do is to say to the legislature, you know, you're not going to agree on a budget. So I'm going to submit a budget, I'm going to hand it to the people and let them vote it up and down. You spend your time as, as part of the revision commission. Let's re you be involved in remaking California's government so it works and we'll let the people make the budget decision because that's where it's going to end up anyway. It always does. Okay, we had a question in the middle here? Yeah. And then, we'll do two more real quick. We've got time. So right there and then down here. Yeah. Right here? Yeah. Um, regarding what Mr. Banks just said about uncompetitive races, um, do you think that campaign finance reform would in some way aid in competitive races and not um, how Prop 14 was written, which would still kind of benefit the two parties. Um, do, you, do you think that maybe some campaign finance that would simply have publicly funded elections, that you, know, you get a certain amount of people on the petition, that, that sign the petition, and then you're on the ballot, and then you can possibly get moderates and liberal districts and moderates and conservative districts who are just the best candidate in the field and not the choice of their party. Um, so if the panel would like to speak on that, but mainly 
Um, if Mr. Finance. Paul could, I'm sorry, Mr. Paul. Okay. Okay. Um, from the short finance. answer is, I, I think, is no. Under under the current Supreme Court decisions, you know, as long as as the Supreme Court can't tell the difference between money and speech, okay. there's precious little we can do to control the influence of large special interest contributions. Uh, uh, you know, a clean money system of the kind, for instance, I, I think you're talking about uh, in California be easily overwhelmed by the, by the uh, money that comes in through independent expenditure committees. We're, we already see it in our elections in, in California today that the independent expenditure committees in most primary and even in a lot of the general elections for legislative seats spend more money than either, either of the candidates themselves. So um, I think that uh, under current law, there's just really nothing, nothing we can do on the spending, the campaign finance side. What we need to do is move toward a, diff a different electoral system, multi-member districts, proportional representation, uh, uh, smaller districts, which would, would help with the money problem because right when you're running in a district in California, you have a half million or a million people, Senate, Assembly and Senate. The only way you can communicate is with big money. Smaller districts would make it easier for real citizen candidates. Any other quick thoughts on campaign finance reform? Okay. Uh, hello. Um, so my question is, um, over this past summer I was involved with the McNair's College Program and I, I did a lot of research um, with tracking budget um, budget um, ups and downs throughout the, to, throughout the years in the UC system specifically, tagging those specifically with the representation of first generation low income and students of color, including AB 540 and undocumented students. And my question is, what happens with all this research that's coming out of um, the UC system and Stanford and a lot of uh, colleges that are doing educational research to try to um, shift the system and have like an ideological shift um, to provide better education and better education modules? But they're not getting communicated into the politics of California, but rather going into Washington, D.C., and they're going into national programs to service other states, but it doesn't come back to California. It's not servicing the Californians where essentially this research is taking place. So I guess my question is what's happening with that disconnect of research um, that's going on in California and is not servicing the students of California. Um, specifically, I'm talking about the research of Chris, Chris Gutierrez, who's the president of the American Educational Research Association. And she's doing a lot of work with um, the Obama presidency in Washington, D.C., but none of those programs are coming to California. They're going somewhere else. And, and we'll have one more question in the back, comments on that question. So right in the back there, and then that will be left. Would anyone like to comment on that question? I don't know. <laughs> All right, I'll be brief. Um, I, would, I would like to comment one thing, though, and, uh, and this gets back to what I said originally about just, you know, you know, ideas and issues being absent from this governor's race, which is focused on you know, the failed politician versus the evil rich lady. Uh, there's no discussion in this governor's race unless I'm missing something about higher education. And it seems to me that we have a real disconnect right now and that we have, we have the, you know, we have the University of California system, the CSUs, and the community colleges, uh, with the purpose of educating children, empowering their minds, sorry, I meant to call you children, uh, with the express purpose of educating folks and putting them in a position to compete in the economy. There are at least three glaring uh, areas of the economy in which I, I'm not sure our colleges do the right job. I'm not sure we produce enough teachers. I'm not sure we produce enough nurses, enough engineers. So I'd like to see these governors at least talk about the 21st century. Bill, Meg, not Meg, Meg Whitman wants to cut welfare and give, put the money okay. into, into UC. But we're not talking about what the So I'm just telling no, I'm just telling okay. you there has okay. been a but, 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 but that is higher but, 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 no, way, that money she wants to cut is not it's kids. I completely she wants to cut I, kids. I, I, okay, make kids go so hungry no, we, to fund their we Yeah, I wanted to say this is one of the most gimmicky okay. things I've ever seen and I don't the idea that you're going to this is another one of those we're going to cut one area and we're going to put into an area that has there's no there's no nexus, there's no connection for it. But it it has actually been something that's just been Quickly, the question and comment was broader in terms of where we're going. But, but I just put out Deborah that if you look at you look at where Meg is advertising, she's spending a bulk of advertising ripping Jerry and not making a choice on whose vision on education and other issues. So. Okay, last question. And what we're going to do is I'm going to ask the panelists to respond to this question and make a couple okay. very brief uh, closing remarks. I know we're going a little over, but this is uh, getting hit. 
more heated up than good, so I didn't want to close it off either. So last question, then I'll give you guys each a couple minutes. Please respond to the question, but then any other closing comments you want to make? First, first of all, yeah. thank you for being here, and thank you for your comments. Uh, I wanted to know, between Whitman and Brown, Brown and Whitman, which of the two candidates do you think would address a broader support for infrastructures such as small business supports, local a, uh, local bus and transportation um, subsidies to, so that people can get to and from work, um, aviation subsidies, um, more educational programs that direct themselves to the skills of the students rather than to the, to the infrastructure or capital improvements and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what, which of those candidates would do a broader kind of infrastructure? You know, roads are going to pot, literally. And um, I'm also seeing that there are a lot of things that the $19 billion deficit has not been attached to, such as yacht moorings that are paid for by local government that have nothing to do with immigrants at all, and a lot of things like avi aviation. So I want to see a broader discussion so of things gonna, like that. Thank you. Moderator's prerogative. I'm going to reframe the question slightly rather than getting into a you for Brown or Whitman to re respond to the, 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 the issue she's referenced, and then a couple of... Uh, a closing a comment from each other. So why don't we do opposite order from where we started? So, uh, Bill, you go first. Uh, I would trust Whitman at this point simply because his daughter's <laughs> not. Yeah, not. Anyway, go ahead. No, I'm, no I'm, because Whitman at least has taken positions on these things, and Jerry hasn't. Jerry's campaign is based on. We had to talk about this before, and we talked about Jerry's campaign as being. Uh, if you remember that Seinfeld episode, The Opposite, George Costanza, where George, George's life is so god-awful, he decides he can do the opposite of his natural reflex, and so he ends up with a, with a great girlfriend and his dream job at the Yankees. That's the Jerry campaign right now. You're running against the rich lady, so you promote yourself as a cheapskate, the opposite. Uh, the rich lady has a plan. I don't have a plan. I'll give it to you after the election. Be contrarian. And it might work for him, but the problem with the contrarian candidacy is I don't know what he's going to do come, uh, come inauguration day, so I'd give her the benefit of the doubt here. Bye-bye. Okay, I'm not voting for Meg Whitman ever. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it at the November 3rd high level here. <laughs> the November 3rd high level. No, I actually, I, I would trust, um, I'd trust Jerry Brown. I mean, and it's more beyond the ideology, but just looking at um, the life he's led, the things he's led, a life of public service. I believe, I do believe that coming into Sacramento, Everybody will give you 50 million sound bites about what they're going to do. But the reality is if they don't understand how state government works, if they don't understand how to work with the, the senators and the assembly people and how to move things around and get things done, really it will just be more fighting all the time, you know, and possibly having the governor spending their own money to go around telling the rest of California how horrible anything, how horrible everything is but not really being able to get anything accomplished. And really that's one of the primary reasons um, that I would vote for Jerry Brown at this point because I think we need to have a governor that can get things done. Um, I like his, and personally I do like his overall philosophies, and really he is cheap. <laughs> I mean, he won't spend a dollar that doesn't need to be spent. Um, so that's it. Deborah? Well, you know, Yvonne hits on a really good issue, uh, which is Jerry Brown's fame cheapness versus Meg Whitman's spending. I think this is just a horrible choice that people are faced with. And I still haven't decided where I'm going to, who I'm, you know, which candidate will win my vote, win being a hopeful word. Um, because this has been a really awful election. Meg Whitman has spent too much, it's, we have to watch somebody who's spending $119 million to tell us that she'll cut government. I, I like, I, 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 I completely agree with Bill, at least, the, the, but the one thing she has going for her is that she has a mandate of sorts. Now, her, her, the thing I pulled out is incredibly gimmicky, but if she is elected, Sacramento lawmakers will understand that the people have spoken and they don't want higher taxes. And, and uh, boy, when Arnold was elected, I remember being in Sacramento. I was in the overflow press tent. They couldn't fit the whole press corps in the, uh, to, to watch his uh, first day of the state speech. speech. Everybody was so afraid of him. And all the, de the Democrats were willing to do anything because he really did come in with a mandate. 
about cutting taxes and, and blowing up the boxes and, and dealing with spending. That's the one thing she has going for her. But whether or not, uh, your, your question, whether or not she can deal with the Democrats in the legislature to get things done. Now, part of me thinks maybe it's sort of like Hail Caesar, that you want somebody who's just going to spend people in, into the ground. I mean, she could always hire, you know, pay them all to not go to work, right? But um, <laughs> if she could be really tough and, and just push her weight around and get what she wants, or is she going to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Is she going to want to be liked? This, this, this document is so fluffy, and she, she won't come out and say difficult things that she should support. So th that's the question with her. As for Jerry Brown? Quickly, Deborah, and then we go. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I want him to give me a reason to believe that he would actually um, cut spending and, and do the things that he has to do, but he has the SEIU endorsement. And he has, the, and, and basically you've got uh, big labor uh, pushing to get him in, and I just, and he won't say anything he'll he, he'd do that they won't like. Okay, Mark, last word. Okay, um, you know, don't tell us who you're going to vote for. Tell us what they can do. <laughs> no, last no, word. no, no, no. <laughs> I, when I, I look at this campaign, you know, what the image that comes to mind, you know, is uh, two people walking down the street. Her and her Armani suits, him and his his tailored lawyer lawyer suits, each of them pushing like homeless people, a, one of those stolen grocery carts, full of crushed cans of recycled ideas um, that have been thrown away by somebody else. This is, I mean, Bill, Bill talked about Seinfeld. You know, Seinfeld was notoriously described as a show about nothing. This has been a gubernatorial campaign about nothing. It's an insult. It's been an insult to the state of California. It's been an insult to, to you as voters. You know, if you were to repay uh, them in kind, you know, you wouldn't vote for either of them because, and actually something good might come out of that because it, under, under our Constitution, the number of signatures that you need to qualify initiative for the ballot is determined by the total number of votes in the last, as a percentage of the okay. votes in the last gubernatorial election. So that if nobody votes in the governor's election this year, it will be actually very e relatively easier and cheaper to qualify measures for the ballot that we might actually fix California. So I, I, I love the summary <laughs> that where we are at, at the state of California is the forum on what the next governor should do. The closing message is don't vote so we can get it. <laughs> But anyway, but, but the other, I think we did set some great ideas out today. I want to thank all four panelists and all of you for your questions and attendance. Thank you very much.